Hello and welcome to the DSP Leaders Summit on the Open Telco. I'm Guy Daniels, Director of Content at Telecom TV, and coming up now is our Challenges and Opportunities Roundtable, where we'll be discussing how to re-architect telcos for an open future. Now, open interfaces, disaggregated systems and best-of-breed multi-vendor network architectures are regarded as vital by an increasing number of major network operators. There's been a lot of focus on designs, blueprints and options during the past 12 to 18 months, but how much progress has actually been made? Well, let's find out what our special guests think, and I'm delighted to introduce Rafael Canto Palanca, who is Transport and IP Network Manager, Global CTIO Telefonica IND, Tim Dwaran, Senior Director, Solution Marketing at Infinera, and Attilio Ozani, Executive Director of TIP, the Telecom Infra Project. Hello everyone, good to see you all. Thank you for taking part in the roundtable. Now, based on input from our viewers, we've drawn up five key questions for discussion. These are the areas that are most important to our community. So here's the first one. Have we reached a point now where it's inevitable that open disaggregated systems will be widely deployed by network operators around the world? Or will this still be a niche industry development? Raphael, perhaps we could come to you first for your initial thoughts. Uh, a very good question indeed. Uh, we believe so. Uh, that this will be a generalized deployment and a wide deployment. Uh, this is happening yes or yes, with or without us, uh, because uh, we are we have been seeing a lot of traction in the industry from both new vendors that are appearing and that are very agile in implementing their solutions, but also from the established ones that are starting to open their portfolios to these solutions. So I think that there is a wide consensus in the operator community uh, that we are both, uh, we are all uh, collectively um, pushing toward these, these open and disability solutions. And this is something that is happening independently on our particular implementation and choices or network topologies. So uh, there are many examples in every network segment, uh, both in MP, open RAN, open broadband, open IP and open transport, and also on every network segment. Um, just to mention some recent examples in IP, the distributed and disaggregated backbone routers projects or the OpenBNG launched by, by TIP. In this last one, the OpenBNG, we are working together with the different operators, Deutsche Telekom, British Telecom, Vodafone, Telecom Italia, and, and we've launched uh, um, an initiative uh, to build uh, an open and disaggregated BNG uh, that is far from our current monolithic boxes and, and um, that uh, we can avoid these lengthy and costly integration processes that we have in our networks. So I think that this is, this is the, the way to go and this is happening for sure. So Tim, why is open and disaggregated networking, including open optical networking, happening now? Uh, it's a great question. And uh, what we usually see with inflections like this is that there's the intersection between um, the technology and the technology uh, maturing, but there's also you know, the pull aspect or the demand um, as well. And so when you take a look at um, all of kind of the things that needed to come together in terms of um, programmatic infrastructure, um, compact modular form factors, um, in optical, particularly the use of, of digital signal processing in coherent um, uh, transponders and in coherent uh, systems. Um, and then the open interfaces um, and the common data modeling. When you kind of bring that all together, um, it's the right time for those pieces to be able to create complete solutions and to also have it be so that operators um, and uh, can, can actually deploy it and, and operationalize these type of uh, solutions. It certainly hasn't been an overnight thing. It's been a journey that um, vendors and service providers have been on for a number of years. Um, and um, it's kind of culminated in this point where we are today uh, with some alignment and timing uh, around those technologies. And, uh, and the overall demand. 
Thanks, Tim. And Attilio, you know, we've just heard from Tim, we heard from Raphael there saying, you know, it's, it's happening, it's been happening a while, it's building up now. Um, we've already heard mention of uh, one of the projects that Telefonica's involved with in TIP. You sit at the heart of uh, open networking projects. So what are you seeing? Is, is it now inevitable that these systems are going to be widely deployed by, by operators globally? Yes, it is inevitable. I, I, I'd say two things. Um, one, it's inevitable. And, and two, it is not niche. Um, and I love the way that both Raphael and Tim speak about it. It's uh, a matter of bringing supply and demand together. There's been supply for quite a while and uh, a drive from the vend a broader vendor community in supplying what operators want and what they need in the future uh, generations of telecoms. And I think the confidence has been growing among the operator community. And we are in that privileged situation in the center, as you say, um, seeing where collaboration is taking place and causing that confidence, not only in the technologies, but in the methods and the, and the, um, uh, the, the capabilities of the solutions that are coming out, not only of our project groups, but of our members uh, and our participants in our, in, in our project groups. And that's part of the purpose of what we do at the Telecom Info Project is to bring supply and demand together in a more um, validated, uh, approved um, way that can scale more swiftly. So we're seeing this in every area. Uh, and I love that we have Tim on, on your show. Um, it's not just about open RAN, albeit important. Um, there are other components of the network that equally need disaggregation and and um, bringing to the uh, bringing to the fore. Yeah, good point, Attilio. You know, it's, open RAN is certainly in the in the limelight at the moment and having it having its moment. But there are many other aspects of the network that are undergoing this or need need to undergo this. Um, brings us on to our next question then from our community. And Tim, maybe I can start with with you first on this one, and that is: Are there too many different roadmaps towards open architectures? Too many choices? for telcos. And rather than accelerate transformation, this is confusion that will just slow it all down. So anytime we're making a transition in the, in the network, I think there's a number of uh, bodies and organizations that inevitably get involved. And really, we need to get involved in part because, you know, we have to do a little bit of trial and error and there are multiple organizations that can contribute. While maybe that leads to some inefficiencies early on, it also kind of bubbles to the surface the best of breed approaches. And I would argue right now that we're really starting to see um, alignment around kind of approaches and uh, in, in, in the, you know, I'll call it the best ways um, to do things like um, when we think about SDN control um, and we try to automate the network, um, you know, I think there's pretty good alignment around the fact that we probably need a hierarchy or some level of single domain control going to a network orchestrator or a multi-domain controller. That's really just one example of, um, you know, I think as an industry, we kind of had to work through that and um, think about and, and bubble to the surface the best ideas. And I think we're, we're making a lot of progress in terms of the use of, of um, open config uh, data models and open interfaces and uh, programmability and discovery and those pieces. And um, it just unfortunately takes a little bit of time to get there. But I think when, we, when you do, with all of those ideas kind of brought together, you do end up with um, some alignment and you end up with a, with a, you know, I'll call it a best of breed approach. Uh, and I think that's firmly where we're headed right now. Okay. Th thanks, Tim. Attilio, let me go straight back to you on this one then, because, you know, you've got a lot of projects going on at TIP. You'll, you'll always have. Uh, there are other groups out there doing similar volumes of projects. If it's inevitable that it's just natural to start developing ideas and see where they go. And that there needs to be some kind of way to, to bring things back and, and focus and, um, and concentrate resources on those approaches that are going to produce the best results then. 
absolutely. Um, look at alignment is is key, and we talked about supply and demand before. But now I think going on to this question, we're talking about uh, alignment of capabilities and requirements. So there are things that are needed in the market today, and there will be um, capabilities that operators require in the market tomorrow and beyond. And we've got to bring in line the this ideology of roadmaps coming in line with capabilities that are available. And bringing those together is a really, really important component of what we do across all of our project groups already. Um, this needs to improve. There is a lot of work to do to make sure that that alignment continues, bringing, bringing um, what is available in terms of features uh, today uh, with what is needed among the operator community and, and other, other organizations in vert other vertical markets too. So uh, look, th there is a lot of work to do in this, in this area and it's not easy and it does need some coordination. And that's what we're about the business of doing. Thank you. And Raphael, as an operator yourself, do you see there are sometimes too many choices, too many roadmaps for, for you to choose from and that this process of, of alignment is, is quite essential? Choices are always good, uh, but it's uh, true that um, that um, uh, you, you risk the, the fragmentation in the market, so, so you need to, to be careful with this. So I think that the, the most important thing is to create common and collaborative specifications, uh, try to aggregate the requirements from the operator community in, in, uh, to build momentum and create a healthy ecosystem. Uh, for example, I, I could I could also mention TIP in the, in the MAST group that has been been uh, uh, created to uh, for the adoption of open transport network based on standard interfaces uh, and to enable a vendor agnostic uh, network mobility and uh, this device configuration with with SDN. So. Um, Interoperability here is key, and, and using open interfaces is, is is key. So we need to be very pragmatic. Um, the objective shouldn't be to create new standards, uh, but uh, just uh, gather together uh, with the rest of the communities, prioritize use cases, see what is important to do, define them together, communicate it to the industry so that they can be implemented and deployed, and 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 then for sure standardize them in, in the proper in the proper organisms, um, selecting them carefully um, based on the maturity of uh, they can provide to support the use cases. And this is what it's been done in, in TIP. Thank you, Rafael. Atilio? Yeah, thanks. That, that, that's exactly right. Um, when, we, when we talk about requirements, what we're talking about is, is commercial needs and those need to be responded to quickly. So what what we what we're in need of is a central rallying coordination point for uh requirements gathering uh, and articulating from operators to the vendor community and that articulation needs to take place in, in in a way where those requirements which are not uh secret source components right um secret source features but are common requirements of operators those can be pulled and recognized by the vendor community and then supplied to much more effectively. So, so that, that important component of bringing together supply and demand is, is just, is just an essential component. And we see an increasing willingness in the operator community to declare, Hey, these are our requirements. This is what we need. We, we need certain levels of feature parity on certain components sooner rather than later. And it's that prioritization of what comes next, that we're in that privileged position of being able to, to, to see to some extent, and then fueling the project groups, the activities, the collective action that's taking place in the marketplace uh, to build together, right? And, and that is one, it's, it's a privileged position and it's pretty amazing to see collaboration actually physically taking place in the industry. Thank you, Atilio. It certainly is. And you're right, you know, operators are being more vocal in uh, getting their needs out um, louder and more clear than perhaps they, they ever have. Brings me on to our next question from our audience then. Um, and, and this is uh, all around best practices. And this is a common theme from our community, to be honest, the need to hear about best practices. There must be proven examples of best practices or lessons learned from the more progressive telcos and their vendor partners, the ones who are 
leading the way in a lot of these areas. Uh, so what are they and, and how can the industry learn from them? Um, Tim, if I can, if I can start with you first on, on this one, you know, have, are there any common lessons through this process of disaggregation and move towards open networking that, that we are already applying? Are, are, are there any um, tips for others who are perhaps not as far along the journey as, as we are? Sure. Um, I have a couple of things that, that come to mind and um, really for the vendor community, one of the top things that, that I can think we've seen is that you can't outrun the service provider. You, you have to meet them where they currently live. And that means, you know, today, but then also understand the aspirations for the future. And I'll, I'll just give you an example of, of what I mean by that. Um, right now, um, our collaboration with the uh, Desegregated Cell Site Gateway or the DCSG project uh, in TIP, um, service providers can purchase our um, CNOS operating system software, but then they have three different ways that they can acquire that cell site gateway hardware. Um, they can buy it uh, from us, they can get it from third party like EdgeCore, or they can actually get the specifications from the OCP TIP community and then approach um, yet someone else um, to manufacture that um, uh, for them. I, I think that's important just um, as an example because you know, maybe a service provider from an operations or a purchasing um, perspective isn't yet ready to take on that multi-vendor kind of um, environment for this solution. And so that's just fine. They can buy the solution from us uh, or from you know, another vendor like us and yet um, evolve over time as their uh, purchasing people are comfortable, their operations and networking and planning people are comfortable taking on more and more of that dis disaggregated role. So I, I think from a vendor community, um, it's really critical to realize you got to meet the service provider where they currently live um, while thinking about um, that transition uh, in the future. And that would be one of the, the top learnings that at least I, I see as a vendor. Thanks, Tim. Uh, Attilio, I'm, I'm glad Tim mentioned the DCSG because I was going to bring that up with you as a, as a great example of a project. Uh, is, is, that, is that something you, you look to within TIP itself as, 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 a, as, a, as a way for other project groups to, you know, to learn from? Yeah, we're a learning organisation. Um, we're an evolving organisation and community. And we learn from successes, from case studies, and we share cr across our project groups as well. When I say we, I mean our community, our, our, our operator partners, participants, and, and the vendor community and the software and hardware. We're all learning this together. I, I think it's it's new enough in the industry to realize that vendors are having to operate in a slightly different way when they approach, um, as Tim said, their, their customers and meeting them where their customers are at. And I think the operator community is evidently, um, we, we, evidently challenged in, in, in that they have to change their practices that have been learned over many years. And you don't change large organizations very swiftly and without care and attention. So we're sharing best practices across our project groups, as you say, from DCSG, which is a shining light. It, it, it is an extraordinary example of having made progress and utilizing those roadmaps and releases as, uh, as an ideology for the industry at, at, at large. Um, but we're also recognizing that the operator community um, is, is also learning um, and learning how to procure perhaps in a slightly different way than they have done in the past. And this is not easy. Um, and to deploy and operate and maintain in, in a slightly different way as well. So look, uh, th this is a journey that we're all on. And I think we're certainly in the Telecom Info Project, um, that, that, that privileged position that I talk about is seeing that journey being trodden in collaboration and, and in a more coordinated fashion. And it is important that we do, we do facilitate that. Best practice sharing and learning. Some operators are going to be more advanced, as you say. So some have the wherewithal and the capacity to take advanced steps. And we've got great examples. We've got Raphael from Telefonica. And Telefonica is famously one of our early board members in the Telecom Info Project. 
and and uh, Vodafone and Deutsche Telekom and British Telekom all making significant moves in the right direction. Um, there are companies in the telecom uh, operator space that that might not have that capacity. They may be a tier two, they may be a tier three, and they deserve excellent connectivity options uh, as a result of disaggregation as well. So I, I think you'll see more and more um, deployments taking place, which is a bigger and broader um, uh, demand signal from from the tier twos and tier threes. And you'll see, you know, um, those operators like those on our board and many others for, uh, that, are, that are out there driving the agenda on behalf of the industry. And this is this is just really great to see. Yeah, certainly is. Thank you, Atilio. And Raphael, what about you? Are there any examples of best practices or, or lessons that perhaps you've learned yourself or you've seen others and, or your vendor partners and how you can apply them or the industry can learn from them? So I, I love uh, the, 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 how, how the, the, the comments that the TU and team both, both made on, on this. Um, uh, I think uh, we are very happy on, on, uh, on how the, the things are progressing in, in with the open community and with the, with the open working. But it's true that uh, this is we are all learning in here, and um, we are in the journey, and there is there is a lot of things that to be solved. So uh, one of the key things that uh, has happened, for example, in BCSG is that we, as operators, we were able to share the early stages of of the product development and and to create this this uh, common specification able to to satisfy all of our our needs. But it's true that there are things in in uh, ahead of of this uh, first availability and first certification of the products that needs to, uh, to be solved, and, and those are were commented like um, uh, procurement or, or or support or or all that comes after after having this this in in, in the field. So um, we need that flexibility. So it's great that uh, that uh, team commented on that because uh, it's true that even for a single operator uh, in, in the different areas in the, the in which we, we operate, the scenario can be different. So so we need that that flexibility. Thank you, Raphael. Um, well, let's move on to our fourth question from our audience, and and this is all around the the concept of blueprints. How important are architectural blueprints and in an open disaggregated world are blueprints the way forward Atilio, maybe i could start with you this time for this question i think blueprints are very important right I, I think um there is that much work to do that we must not duplicate our efforts um so as as uh, telefonica take a lead in dcsg uh, other operators may take a lead in open ran and as they go through and create those best practices and get the right components from different um, uh, solution providers, both hardware and software, and put them together, I think creating blueprints and remembering how the recipe goes and letting others know how that recipe works is a really important component. And it's the facilitator of your previous question about uh, about best practice sharing. And 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 that really is just such it's such an essential component um imagine imagine the uk um creates a blueprint and doesn't tell anyone else in the world for the same thing that uh, that is created in in perhaps france or or italy or further afield um this just isn't uh, a coordinated approach so it's bringing all of these questions together and actually saying coordination is 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 as key when it comes to blueprints and best practice sharing and, uh, and roadmaps and specifications being aligned, um, it, it, it's going to get us there faster, right? Uh, and we need to go faster and we need to be more aligned. This is just more efficient. Thanks, Atilio. Uh, Tim, any thoughts about blueprints? And as um, Atilio says, you know, is, is this a way to get us there faster? I was just gonna offer, um, you know, blueprints is one of those ways we can kind of institutionalize learning um, and uh, at, at least uh, create a starting point um, for others, right? And from, from learning from organization A to, to organization B, um, I fully expect that each service provider, of course, has their own network. They have their own 
legacy infrastructure. They have their own, um, you know, competitive environment and and their own um, objectives from a new services perspective and the rest. So every service provider is going to be unique and different. But the blueprint really um, that that approach is really a way to to help institutionalize that learning and to create starting points um, for others uh, and that that kind of shared environment. Um, and so in that sense, yeah, I think it's, I think it's great. Excellent. Thank you. And, and Raphael, what are your thoughts on blueprints and how they can be used as we move towards more open disaggregated networks? So, so it's, uh, it's an excellent question. Uh, I think that they permit to simplify things. Um, we are doing ex an external improvement in opening our networks, but uh, as, as I commented before, we are just starting in some areas and being able to use an architectural blueprint uh, with uh, reference species uh, and solutions and services uh, can help us to eliminate risks and to accelerate time to market, which is very important. And, and the only question here is that we need to do it always um, using open interfaces that permit to avoid uh, lock-ins in the future. So that's because this, this is something that we, we want to avoid for sure. Thank you very much. Well, that brings us to our final question from our audience here. And this is about pre-certified or pre-integrated solutions. Are these pre-certified, pre-integrated solutions becoming more important? And if so, is there a danger of some kind of lock-in with pre-integrated solutions? Tim, perhaps I could come to you first for your thoughts. So if you look at open networking today, I'll use an example, kind of open optical networking. And if we're going to insert a new uh, transponder or a new um, optical engine into the network, um, I think service providers are looking for the vendor community, um, you know, to stand behind those solutions and to say, hey, this thing interoperates and this thing works at all of these levels, not just at some you know, steady state, but also through transient conditions and, and, and other things. And so I would argue that a lot of that is, is on the vendor community as part of just doing business and standing behind um, their solution and their insertion into the network um, in this open and disaggregated manner. So that would kind of be number one. Um, number two, there certainly will be um, um, unique or custom or broader kind of integration activities. And there certainly is an ecosystem of um, um, integration uh, suppliers or integration services partners. Um, you know, Radisys, um, now part of Reliance is, is just an example that, that comes to mind. I think they certainly have a role to play in this ecosystem. And, um, you know, the good news is as long as things remain open and disaggregated and, um, you know, we're putting it together and the vendors are standing behind their piece. And then if there's bigger work from the, a bigger um, integration uh, ecosystem, I think we can minimize that risk of, of lock in while also getting um, some assurance uh, and some um, um, confidence that um, our solution, you know, is working and that it can be deployed uh, in these manners. So I think we can balance the risk of the, of the kind of lock-in uh, from at least my perspective. Thanks, Tim, good to hear. Uh, Attilio, any thoughts on pre-integrated solutions and, and the role they're playing? Yeah, uh, it, 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 it's important that we, um, we, we test um, and we validate and, and um, make sure that there's greater confidence in the capabilities and the features that are coming from, from vendors, but we need to do that increasingly in um, in solution sets, not just single product uh, 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 capabilities, but entire solution sets where you're splicing together an entire end-to-end -end network um, from from an, perhaps a number of different vendors and, um, and, and orchestrating it via either your own software or software from another, another vendor again. And as a result, integrations are, are an essential component of making sure that there is confidence in the, the robustness of the solutions coming out. Now, th that doesn't mean there's no choice. Um, in fact, uh, imagine a case where Tim's solution um, is deployed in a network, but um, uh, perhaps Raphael 
is interested to see what another vendor has as, as an opportunity to to replace those. That level of integration um, can be can be incorporated in, into Telefonica's choices, and 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 then perhaps there's a little bit of competition there between the vendor community to do best in class, most efficient, best capabilities, new advancements in technology, um, uh, in terms of of what they what they offer. So I think there's going to naturally be, as a result of this renewal of the ecosystem, greater competition and greater drive towards innovation and responding to operator requirements um, as we as we advance into this new arena of uh, a broader supply chain. Thanks, Attilio. So, Raphael, final thoughts from you um, about the subject of pre-certified or pre-integrated solutions and the role they're playing and whether or not there are any dangers with them? I think that the dangers uh, would, uh, will depend on how cluster of pre-integrated solutions in, in, uh, interact with each other. Uh, we uh, up to now what we, we've seen is that these movement, movements are occurring naturally in the, in the, open, the transform IP area and it's good. Um, it's, it helps to gain trust and confidence in the solutions and, and, and it makes sure that when we are going to a commercial process, uh, all the, we as an operator are confident because the solutions being presented are already pre-tested and, and we can somehow treat them uh, as an additional vendor because they, they are already working together. And also when, when in, in a solution, in, when, when we are going to a system integrator, um, it's good for the system integrator since they have the, the, the confidence that uh, the solution has, is being pre-tested in community labs uh, hosted by operators and, and, and also it, permit, it permits to them that they have the, the flexibility so that uh, they can cooperate with the, freely with the companies that they, they, they consider best uh, based on the basis on, on, on mutual trust and common interest which would, wouldn't be the case if, if not. So I think, I think that this is, uh, these solutions are helping the, the ecosystem. And, and, and the key here, again, is uh, to maintain open interfaces uh, so that uh, solutions are exchangeable. But so far, it, it's, it's been great. Well, that is good. And it's always good to end a discussion on a very positive note because we have to draw our discussion to a close now. Thank you all very much for participating and sharing your views and opinions. Now, if you're watching this on day one of our DSP Leaders Summit on the Open Telco, then don't forget to send us any questions you have on this subject and we'll try and answer them in our live after show programme later today. And do take part in our online poll. You can find it below this video player window next to the Q&A app. All of today's programmes are available to view online here at Telecom TV. We'll be back tomorrow with another roundtable discussion for you. Until then, thank you for watching and goodbye.